That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Lily. Let's give her one more hand. Woo. So funny. I'm having a Fleetwood Mac week. <laughs> I was at the coach house on Friday night. There was a tribute band that was doing the Rumors album, Cut for Cut. It was really great. So thank you, Lily, for bringing that back for me again so I could enjoy that. I've, was, uh, I love the little synchronicities of life. Well, welcome and good morning. My name's Alice Reed, and I'm the spiritual director here, and I'm um, happy to be with you today. I want to give you just a really brief update about um, our former board president, Lee Vance. Like many of you know that um, Lee and Dina had a car terrible car accident about a month ago, and Dina did not survive the accident. Um, Lee has been um, in ICU until yesterday, and he has been moved out of ICU, and now they're looking at uh, opportunities for him to begin to uh, move out of the hospital. We think it'll be anywhere between two to four weeks when he'll be released. Um, we're trying to keep you updated about all this, and I know there have been many questions about when we would do a memorial for Dina, and um, Lee really hasn't been in the place to to help us with that, and so we're waiting for him to, uh, to recover sufficiently. And uh, as we know more, we'll let you know more. And so I encourage you to continue to pray for our beloved Lee as he moves forward in his recovery. He, I, I do want you to know that his son, D, um, David Vanslyke, has been um, an amazing support to him. He has been by his side every day. And so Lee is well cared for right now. And so we'll continue to care for him in our prayers and in our kind thoughts. Um, finally, uh, in our weekly newsletter, there's a link to a private page on our website if you want to keep up with Lee's progress. There's a little going uh, uh, list there about all the things that Lee's been doing to recover and get back to us. So we, we miss him terribly, but we know he'll be back with us again soon. <sighs> so <laughs> uh, there's no segue into my talk with that. <laughs> um, uh, I will tell you that um, our theme this year of living out loud has been um, a wonderful walk through these ways for being more out loud about who we are and our philosophy and the amazing tools that we have. Uh, as Reverend Judy talked about, her first experience walking into a center 34 years ago. Well, 34 years later, we're pretty much one of the best kept secrets out there. <laughs> and so, you know, we have this beautiful philosophy that really empowers us to engage life in in really amazing ways. And so this year's theme about living out loud is an opportunity for us to really embrace our philosophy and to walk it out in the, our day-to-day -day life. And the theme for this month is speaking truth to circumstances. And we've been looking at what that means. We looked at our fears and then we looked at how we could go unconscious to things. And then we looked at how truth really supports us. Truth being that um, beautiful idea of uh, the one infinite reality, the divinity that is imbued in all of life. When we can stand on that truth, it really does move mountains for us. And today's topic is the wise warrior. The wise warrior. And I think when we first think about this idea of the wise warrior, it you know, I looked it up. I like when we when we have these words that don't quite fit into a sentence with talking about our spiritual tools. I like to look up the the words we're talking about. Of course, like wise does fit in with our principles, but warrior, not so much. I don't think of myself as a warrior all the time. A warrior is uh, defined in the um, Webster's and various dictionaries as someone who is a brave and courageous. Uh, soldier or fighter. And, and I think there are times when we are dealing with circumstances that it, it definitely calls for us to rise up and to be brave and to be courageous. C courageous. I think I just made up a new word. <laughs> 
creative, courageous. Um, when it, um, it's actually the second time I've done that. <laughs> uh, but when it's time for us to be really uh, courageous, uh, and we can uh, take on some of those uh, characteristics of a warrior. And yet, we're looking at this idea of speaking truth to circumstance. And so the theme is really about how do we take this philosophy that we talk about every Sunday and in classes. So you, many of you have taken classes, understand that there's some principles that we work with and we learn to you, you know, garner a spiritual tool kit that we can pull spiritual tools out of. So, so how, do we, how do we be spiritual when we're dealing with circumstances and events that don't feel spiritual? Um, you know, I think it starts with uh, thinking about the things that we do know. We do know that this is a teaching that is uh, helping us to understand the power of our thoughts, that everything is created twice, first in consciousness and then in form. We know that there's a uh, power that happens, a shift that happens when, the, when we change our thoughts, our experiences shift. We understand that our, by examining our beliefs and the things that have we've settled on and that we're reacting from that that's how we begin to change our thoughts by first digging down and looking at our beliefs and of course we know that for every cause there is an effect right we know the laws of cause and effect and as i was thinking about this i was thinking about how easy it is to get a little trapped in the effect even when we're being uh, spiritual warriors I, uh, oftentimes we try to find the meaning for things like, you know, oh, if this has happened to me, what was in my mind to make me think, you know, something that would create this condition? Um, and we do that so much that, you know, someone will walk up to you and say, you know, you'll say, oh, I've got a terrible cold. And they might say something like, well, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, it's not as funny as it sounds, but <laughs> when it happens to you... <laughs> I, I actually was, a colleague was telling me how she was getting ready to do her talk and she leaned down to pick something up and her back went out, you know, and she's getting ready to get on the platform and she walks into the kitchen, she says, asks this practitioner, do you have any ibuprofen? And the practitioner said, oh, you must be carrying a lot. And my colleague's like, I just want some freaking ibuprofen. <laughs> Sometimes that all, that's all it is. Sometimes we have these experiences and they're just experiences. Um, really, when we look at this idea of digging down into our beliefs and, and what is it that needs to be weeded out, that's when we have these repeated experiences in our lives. You know, that, like the, when you continually change your jobs but you're still working with the same person, they just change names and, and bodies, <laughs> but they're the same person you're dealing with over and over again, or maybe you're in the same relationship with somebody over and over again, even though they might be different people. Those kinds of situations are when it's time for us to begin to look at the the thinking or the cause behind something, some kind of set of beliefs that, we're, that we've been carrying that are ready to be shifted when we wake up enough to begin to notice that there's something that we've been carrying out into the world and helping to create in our experiences. And I think sometimes when we have these challenges, whether they be relationship challenges, economic challenges, health challenges, it gets tempting to get really lost in uh, everything we're experiencing. And I heard this great quote, and it was in response to somebody who was just saying, well, if you knew, if you knew how hard life was for me right now, and the person responded, instead of telling God, how big your problems are, try telling your problems how big your God is, right? And so this idea of changing your thinking and, and when you get stuck in some of these polarities of looking at what's going on in the world and that there's a, a, a need to shift it, you become awake enough to know that you've got some part in it, those are the times when we begin to draw on our faith and to know that we're working with a power that is so big 
that there's no circumstance that it can't deal with. And so if we look at this idea of being wise warriors, I think the, the wise warrior isn't the warrior that is out there doing battle with conditions. It's the wise warrior that looks within, that begins to know that any battle that they have to fight is, starts right here within ourselves in what we're thinking and what beliefs we might be carrying that have us continually having these themes come up in our life. You know, as I thought about today's topic of the wise warrior, I was, and, and this need to go within and the, uh, that sometimes it's the battle about around us and it, yet it may be the battle inside of us, I was, think two things came to mind. The first thing was, this model of consciousness that some of you might be familiar with, I've talked about it from time to time, it's called the Kingdoms of Consciousness. And it's really a model that looks at how we relate to God. How do we relate to consciousness? What is our part and what do we bring to the equation so that we're having the experiences that we're having? And the other thing that came to mind was Star Wars. And I was thinking about the the evolution of the characters in Star Wars as they moved through the storyline of, of doing battle with evil and then coming home to themselves. If you're not familiar with Star Wars, I, I think you'll still be able to follow along. If you would put the slide up, Mary. And so I put together this little slide. I know it's little. Um, <laughs> But when we talk about the kingdoms of consciousness, the first kingdom is often the kingdom of things are happening to me and we very reactive. And so I was thinking Darth Vader was a great example of kingdom one because Darth Vader is using this, the force to his own, to bend the circumstances to his own will. Clearly he's responding from something that he feels needs to be changed and he's doing it in a way that's, that's, um, Oh, power over, if you remember two weeks ago, I talked about the difference between power over and power with. And so Darth Vader is sort of that kingdom one relationship that we have. And I do need to say one more thing before I go through this model, and that is with the kingdoms of consciousness, it's not like first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. It isn't hierarchical. We're all in these different kingdoms at the same time. And so the before I look at the characters, the first kingdom is that place where we might feel like a victim or we might feel like we're fighting life. The second kingdom is where we're really strategizing about how to solve all our problems in life. The third kingdom is when we begin to surrender ourselves to this power that is greater than us and it can use us. And the fourth kingdom is when we recognize our complete oneness with all life. And what I'll say about that is that that is reserved for few circumstances. I think as we evolve as humanity, more and more of us are having glimpses of Kingdom Four. So, so just to have some fun with this idea of Star Wars, the the you know I saw Darth Vader as that Kingdom One representative. That you know he was responding in a way through anger and, um, gosh, I can't even read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anger and hurt and woundedness. And then when we move up to Kingdom 2, this is where we meet our character Luke in the story, Sky Wa uh, Star Wars. And with Luke, um, he is working with the rebellion to, to strategize and to figure out how they can overcome the evil empire, right? So that's Kingdom 2, where his best ideas are carrying him forward. We find when we move to Kingdom 3, and I gotta say, Kingdom 3 is like my favorite place to hang out. I don't always hang out there. <laughs> it's sometimes it's a little hard for me to get to that place of surrender when I can drop into Kingdom 3. But it's that beautiful idea that I don't have to do all the heavy lifting, that there is a power greater than me that is animating this whole entire world that I don't have to keep the stars spinning in the sky. I can rely on that power when I, I come to that place of surrender. And so for the character for Kingdom 3, I was thinking 
uh, Luke becomes Skywalker, and uh, Ben, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Ben Kenobi becomes Obi-Wan. And there's this great scene in the original Star Wars where uh, Obi-Wan is fighting Darth Vader, and they've got their lightsabers, and they're doing battle, and, you know, it's really dire. And finally, Obi-Wan just takes his lightsaber, and he stands there. And we think that he's been killed. But what he's done is he's surrendered himself fully to the divinity within him. He's surrendered the fight. He's let go of the battle, and he's completely absorbed by the Force so that he becomes one with the Force. And when we look at this fourth kingdom of oneness, it's, the, it's Yoda and it's Obi-Wan Kenobi after he surrendered himself completely. And that's when the, um, there's more to the battle than just the fighting. Now, there's still circumstances and things that have to be dealt with on a one-to-one -one basis in, in our daily lives, but like um, Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan, they use the Force to help guide them. They use the Force to help them understand what are the right things for them to do. And if you remember in the movie, Luke is often in doubt of himself. He's often questioning himself. He's often questioning his own confidence. And it's only when he surrenders that inner battle that he begins to really get in touch with the Force and know what the right things to do are, the right moves to make, the right, the right fighter ship to fly. He becomes the wise warrior when he surrenders to the Force. And I think the, the saying I have, if I can read that, with uh, the fourth kingdom from Yoda is, um, I think I can read it better from here, one with the force I am. <laughs> one with the force I am. And so our work as wise warriors is to see those places where we might be doing battle first, where we, meet, we might be fighting circumstances. Believe me, there are a lot of circumstances that need our attention in the world. There are a lot of places where people need help. But our work is really to drop into that place within that is completely connected and guided and guarded always. It comes to us through our spiritual practices. It comes to us through prayer, meditation, spiritual affirmations. It comes to us through classes and and spiritual education. It comes to us through spiritual community. We learn the things to do in response to life and its events versus the knee-jerk reaction of, I've got to fight this. There may be some action that each of us need to take in the places that we feel the most need, the most drawn upon. But if we don't stop and pause and open up our spiritual toolbox first. We'll just be fighting the fight as opposed to really connecting with the true power that lives within us and then moving from that place forward. It really is the, um, the story of the uh, Arjuna and we talked a little bit about the Bhagavad Gita and the story of Arjuna, who is the prince who is fighting the uh, war for the security of his, his homeland. And he goes out to, f to fight, and he's, been a, he's, he's just like I described from Webster's. He's a warrior who is brave, and he's been trained, he's experienced, soldier and warrior and fighter and he knows what to do and he's in his chariot and he goes up to the battle and he looks across the yard, the, the land where they're about to have this battle and he sees his kinfolk across the way. He sees his uncles and his cousins and his brothers and they are the warriors on the other side of the battle and it symbolizes that place that when we are fighting we have to remember that there's we're fighting ourselves. And so in the story, in that allegory of Arjuna, he drops to the floor of the chariot and he just can't do it. He can't kill his kin. 
And uh, fortunately for him, the chariot driver happens to be Krishna in disguise. <laughs> and the rest of the 600 pages <laughs> are all about his journey of awakening and becoming the true wise warrior. How to use spiritual tools so that he can remember who he is. How to use spiritual tools so he can remember the, the full out divinity of all life, even in the places where he's been compelled to do battle. You can take that down, Mary. I found this quote from Ernest Holmes, and it reads, Error is ever a coward before truth and cannot hide itself from reality, which sees through everything, encompasses all, and penetrates even the prison walls of our mind with its clear light. So he's talking about that when we are awake, when we do our spiritual practices, when we meditate, when we remember and raise our awareness, that truth comes forward. So that when we're dealing with circumstances in the world, however dire they may seem, that there's work we do here first, and then we walk it out into the world. And when we do that, when we do that work from within first, we're always guided. We're always to knowing what is the right thing for us to do. So my invitation for you this week is to notice the places that cause you to the, feel the need to do battle or to fight, even if it's just an argument with your beloved over the toothpaste or the, you know, who's taken out the trash. The opportunity in those little small acts is to pause and to see what, what's inside of you that is causing you to want to fight. You know, in my everyday life, what I find is often it's my ego and my desire to be right about something. And I have to remind myself that it's not so important, that what's most important is the relationship I'm, I'm growing and evolving with this person. And so as you go through this week, I, I, I advise you to do like Obi-Wan, to pause, to surrender your sword to the moment and to allow your ego to be slayed so that you can truly walk out whatever circumstance you find yourself in, fully empowered by that force in life, that thing that makes the grass grow that wants to support you in every situation where there isn't anything that you experience where you aren't supported. Thank you very much. So thank you. Let's go ahead and go into prayer. This is our, our way of praying. It's a affirmative prayer. And it's a beautiful little formula, a formula of God is, I am, this is so, we're grateful for it, and I let it go. And so I know that the power and the presence of the one mind, the one heart, the one love that permeates all life is present here and now. Every time I remember the here and the now, and even when I don't. And so as I speak this word for myself and the first person, I know this for me and I know this for all within the sound of my voice, that we are deeply connected, deeply connected with spirit, deeply connected with creation, and that that creative life force is always pouring itself into us. So as we move through this week, being willing to elevate our awareness to looking to the places where we might want to fight, to push, to argue. The invitation is to pause, to be willing to surrender a little bit, not to be won over, but to remember who we are. We are indeed little bits of God, little bits of love that have incarnated as the seven billion beings on the planet, as all the animals that grace the planet, of all the sea creatures, all the rocks, the trees, the plant life, there isn't any place 
that God has not found itself. So when we remember that, it's easy to surrender. And we allow that power and that presence to remind us of exactly how big it is and exactly how small our problem is. And so we surrender to it, knowing we are cared for and knowing that it's temporary and knowing that's what's real and what's permanent is the love that created you and I exactly the way we are. So we give great thanks for this. Dropping into our heart in pure gratitude, I simply release this word, knowing the truth, the truth over circumstances, for you and for me in this moment now. And we simply anchor this truth by saying, and so it is. Thank you. And now.